Ma'am, is there any technical problem? Can we start? No, sir. Yeah, can we can start now? Yes. Okay, I was waiting for you to tell me. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So um, last time we looked at uh, discontinuous function, which was one of the solutions of uh, the inviscid Berger's equation. That's where uh, um, we were headed towards. So please, ma'am, you can continue. Okay. Yeah, I'll start now. I'll share the screen and start. Okay, I'll give a quick summary of what we have seen last time until now. So uh, we have started with continuum modeling. So we saw how continuous the physical space is and we saw how to model the variables uh, that we are concerned about, like density, velocity and pressure and all. So uh, we saw that in the first class. Then we went on to uh, saying that uh, any tangent to a vector field becomes the solution curve for uh, the PD corresponding to that vector field. Then uh, that's how we solve the uh, first order PDs. Then we extended that to solving quasi linear first order PDs through implicit function theorem. And then we classified the PDs into hyperbolic, parabolic and elliptic. So uh, we saw that hyperbolic PDs have two real and distinct characteristics passing through each point. Then we saw that elliptic characteristics have no real characteristics at all. Elliptic PDs have no real characteristics at all. And uh, parabolic PDs have one real characteristic passing through each point. And then uh, we went on to uh, seeing method of characteristics for solution of uh, for solving hyperbolic PDs. So there we saw a linear advection equation first. So there we came across uh, the fact that so characteristics for linear advection equation are just parallel lines in the XT plane. So uh, any initial condition that you give will keep uh, moving towards right or left depending on the uh, wave speed. Essentially the uh, parameter A in your uh, dx by dt equals A in your PD. So then we saw how if that if that parameter is a function of uh, position and time, then the characteristics will become curved and all. Then we saw if the character, if that parameter it becomes a function of u, then uh, at each point in the xt plane, that is at each initial condition uh, on the x line, that is at t equals zero, you have different values of u. So uh, the slope of the characteristics in xt plane will be different at different points. So it's, they are still straight lines, but the slope will be different at different points. This way we end up getting converging, diverging characteristics and all. So this uh, this parameter becoming a function of u uh, results in formation of converging and diverging characteristics, etc. So that results in uh, formation of shock and expansion waves. Uh, converging characteristics result in formation of uh, shock waves because after uh, the characteristics converge, uh, the PD breaks down. That is, the derivatives of the PD do not exist anymore, and uh, your um, you cannot find use the method of characteristics anymore to find the solution of the PD. So we construct a piecewise linear solution, piecewise constant solution. We construct some curve, and to the left and right of the curve, we take the same solution, which was through method of characteristics and we find that uh, speed of that curve using uh, we went through integral form of PDEs and uh, we also saw Leibniz integral rule to find the speed of that new curve that we constructed. That becomes essentially the discontinuity in our case. Then uh, we went on to seeing expansion wave solutions. So where the which result uh, which is the result of diverging characteristics. So those uh, we saw uh, for expansion wave solutions, we had two different uh, things. That is when diverging characteristics occur, we uh, formed shock wave solutions and expansion wave solutions as well. But in case of shock wave solutions, we saw a contradiction. So only expansion wave solutions serve as the actual solutions in the diverging characteristics region. So then we uh, gave a condition known as entropic condition to 
make sure that the slope is always bounded from right side like that the slope is uh, bounded on the positive side but on the negative side it's unbounded so when um, you have a discontinuity into the left let's say ul is the value of u at the left to the left of the discontinuity and u r to the right of the discontinuity so if ul is greater than u r then that discontinuity is a valid discontinuity it's a shock it's valid but if ul is less than u r that discontinuity is not valid it becomes an expansion wave it doesn't remain as a shock throughout the solution so that we saw through entropy condition and uh, we also saw it through a different way and we obtained a contradiction as well so in two different ways we obtained a uh, shock and expansion wave solutions uh, for a diverging i mean for we obtained solutions for diverging characteristics and we ensured that only expansion wave solutions are possible in two different ways today let us see uh, weak solutions and weak form of conservation law so as a continuation of this um, through, for finding the shock wave solutions we went to the integral form of conservation law and uh, we originally started with a pde but uh, when the PDE breaks down, we go to the integral form of conservation law. Now, uh, this is something uh, close to the integral form only. This also weak form also has an integral coming into the picture. Uh, we'll see how they are close and we'll see what kind of solutions this weak form of conservation law will have. Like any uh, solution to the weak form of conservation law becomes a weak solution. So for that, let us first define what a classical solution is. Classical solution is the solution to the PDE itself. So let us consider this initial value problem. So which is uh, dou u by dou t plus dou phi by dou x equals zero defined on the x real line from minus infinity to infinity. And uh, uh, in terms of for t, it runs, it, it's defined on the positive real line. And the initial condition is given by u naught of x. So our, our flux variable phi uh, has continuous first derivatives because uh, anyways phi x is defined and phi x is continuous. So this PDE is defined properly. So phi x must be continuous and the, the initial condition is also continuous. So now for this initial value problem, um, a, solu a function is called a classical solution. A function u is called a classical solution if uh, it satisfies these four criteria that is u must be first of all continuous and uh, derivatives of u must exist and they also must be continuous and uh, you should satisfy the given pde for all x and for all t defined over here and uh, you must also satisfy the initial condition these are some ba basic uh, necessities for something calling some function to be a solution so when these criteria are satisfied, then that function is called a classical solution of the initial value problem. Now we are trying to differentiate between classical and weak solution. So if the PD gets satisfied exactly, then that function is called classical solution. Uh, for weak solution, you need not be continuous or differentiable. Uh, but these functions are solutions in a different sense. These are not actually solutions to the PDE, but they'll be solutions to the weak form of conservation law. So now let us see what a weak form of conservation law is. So <coughs> let, for this, let us first take a real valued function t of x comma t, so which is called as a test function in our case. So we, we are going to call this function as a test function from now on. So we are just taking some function whose uh, derivatives exist and are continuous for all x and for all t that we have taken so now we can we think uh, we now say that there is some circle on the xt plane such that uh, this function that we have taken is zero on or outside that circle so suppose i'm just taking a two dimensional thing now one dimensional picture so uh, this is x and this is t one dimensional picture in the sense the physical space is one dimensional and uh, when you also include t it becomes two dimensional so uh, now on this we are taking a test function so t of x comma t is defined everywhere so let's say we have some circle in any any of the uh, we can have it anywhere anywhere wherever you want i'm just taking it here so 
Now the inside this circle T will be non zero and outside this circle everywhere in the X T plane T will be zero. T is such a function. It's not necessarily be a circle. It need not be just a circle. It can be some random uh, closed region as well. So inside that region, we can define T to be non-zero and outside that region, we can define T to be zero. So for, for simplicity, we have taken it to be a circle. So there is also uh, now T is a function which is non-zero inside and zero outside some region. And it or, or also we have said that its derivatives exist and are continuous. An example of that is given over here. So inside the circle, T is uh, defined as this uh, e power minus one over one minus x square minus t square. And outside the circle, on and outside the circle, it's zero. So now uh, let us uh, first, for de deriving the weak form, let us first assume that there is some uh, function u whose classical solution, uh, function u which is a classical solution to the PDE, which means that uh, this PDE gets satisfied exactly by some u. Let us first assume that. And then uh, now let us take some test function. So now uh, when you multiply uh, your classical solution by that test function, that is t of x comma t into u, then uh, this will be equal to u on and outside the circle in the xt plane that we have constructed. So which means that when you do this operation, uh, some portion of u alone is getting isolated. That is now t into u will be non-zero in the region that you have constructed and it will be zero everywhere. So u is actually a function defined in the whole xt plane. Now you are isolating only a portion of that u in, uh, which is inside the, re uh, inside the region where t is non-zero just by doing this multiplication. So now uh, let us multiply this uh, differential equation that we have, that is the PDE, ut plus uh, phi x equals zero. We, let us now just multiply the whole PDE by t of x comma t. So this part gets multiplied with t into this t into rho phi by rho x equals zero. And then uh, let us integrate the whole thing over both x and t. So we have dx t. So that's what is written in this first equation. dx is, runs from minus infinity to infinity and dt runs from zero to infinity. So now uh, from here to here, we use this uh, integration by parts. So for example, uh, integration by parts is this u dv equals uv minus integral v du. So the same thing has been used here. Uh, suppose you have some uh, limit, say, to be over here, that limit will be substituted. So this is your integration by parts. So I, I'm using it for each of these terms. So for each of these terms separately. So let us first consider the first term which is uh, dou u by dou t into t of x comma t. That is integrated with respect to dt and dx. So here the variable is uh, u is differentiated with respect to t. So I'm taking this integ first integration as dt and second one as dx. So I'm first trying to uh, do apply integration by parts for this integral. The other integral will leave as such. So um, this integration by parts has been applied over here. So this thing has been uh, taken as u and uh, dou u by dou t into dt has been taken as dv. u part is uh, t. So when you do integration by parts, you will get uh, this thing. And now this integral, if, uh, this part, if you notice, after integration, what you have here is this, the limits go from zero to infinity. And we have defined T as a, a non-zero quantity inside some region and it's zero everywhere. So T at, uh, T, at T for all X at uh, uh, this quantity T is at X comma infinity is going to be zero. 
because of the way we defined t, this quantity is going to be zero. So we'll only have this t of x comma zero part. So after substitution of limits, we'll only have this term remaining. The other term will go to zero because t is zero as t approaches infinity. And this term will still remain the same. Similarly, for the second term, this term that we had, dou phi by dou x into t of x comma t dx dt. So this again, let's do integration by parts. So here, uh, dou phi by dou x, uh, phi is differentiated with respect to x. So I'm keeping dx as my integration variable. So um, first integral. So this thing will be uh, integration by parts will be applied to this uh, integral now. So this is my u and uh, D, uh, dv is uh, phi x dx. Now doing integration by parts, we get these two terms. Now uh, we can see that uh, the limits here are min infinity and minus infinity. So as x approaches plus or minus infinity, t of x comma t approaches zero because of the way we define t. So this term will go to zero. So we'll only have this term remaining. So, uh, so now our uh, one the equation one that is this equation, it has become something like this. After uh, we have evaluated each of these two, two terms separately, now let us substitute these back in one. So we get such an equation. So we have two integrals, and this is the part after integrating out uh, this initial condition part, t of x comma zero, which we had. So that comes over here. So this is basically the weak form for our PD ut plus dou phi by dou x equals zero. So this becomes the weak form. So if now you can notice that weak form does not involve any derivatives in u because the derivatives have now been transferred to t. Derivatives, I mean, we had ut in the PDE that has now been transferred to t. We have dou t by dou t and the derivative of phi x dou phi by dou x now has been transferred to dou t. The derivative has been transferred to t. That's why we do integration by parts. So basically to transfer the derivatives from one variable to another variable. So now u and phi are free of derivatives. So now in this weak form for solve any any u that satisfies this weak form need not have a uh, need not have existence of derivatives, need not have a continuity of derivatives as well. So uh, we, we need not care about how the derivatives behave, derivatives of u behave essentially, if we are solving the weak form. So uh, that is one advantage and uh, a weak solution for this initial value problem. Now what do we call as weak solution for this? So basically, uh, a classical solution for the PDE, for the PDE that we have, we defined what a classical solution is. So u must be continuous, ut must exist, and they, that also must be continuous. It must satisfy the PDE, ut plus phi x equals zero, and it must satisfy the initial condition. That is a classical solution. So now a weak solution for the same PDE will be some solution that satisfies this weak form of conservation law for all possible test functions. We have taken an arbitrary test function t over here. So any for any possible test function that satisfies that form, that is uh, t, t and t, x must exist and they must be continuous. And uh, t should be non-zero in some region in the xt plane and it must be zero everywhere. So for there, there are many possible tests. We can construct many different test functions that satisfy this criteria. So for all possible uh, test functions, uh, if some u satisfies this uh, integral form, if some u so, uh, actually solves this thing, then that u becomes the weak solution for your PDE. We call that as the weak solution for this PDE. Now the weak solution does not, as we can see, it does not require the existence of derivatives and a uh, weak form of conservation law actually accounts for both PDE and the initial condition because the initial condition appears over here. So we need not explicitly uh, take into account the initial condition. It actually appears in the weak form itself. So it takes care of both PDE and the initial condition. The only thing is the 
derivatives are now being shifted to the test function instead of u. So this is the weak form and uh, any solution to the weak form becomes the weak solution of the PDE. So any doubts in weak solutions and weak form? No, ma'am, please continue. Okay. Yes, so I'll go to something called uh, systems of conservation loss. So uh, now uh, as until now we have seen that uh, all we have seen is for scalar conservation loss. So we have seen uh, in VC Burgess equation and uh, some different examples like linear advection equation and all these are scalar conservation loss. But uh, if you notice the microscopic uh, physical system uh, is governed by uh, Euler's equation or Navier-Stokes equation, which consists of uh, conservation of mass, momentum and energy. So this becomes a system of conservation loss. So um, now how are we going to uh, find some solution that satisfies all of these three or four equations simultaneously? So uh, such uh, for finding uh, for solving such systems of conservation loss, we need to go through some similar theory for uh, solutions for systems of conservation loss as well. So now let us uh, shift to uh, let us now extrapolate all the concepts that we have learned for scalar conservation loss, like existence of shock waves, the converging characteristics, diverging characteristics, and all, uh, like shock and expansion waves correspondingly, and um, the entropy condition, uh, those things, and weak form and weak solutions, etc. All of these now will be extrapolated to the systems of conservation loss. So, for this, um, let us consider some uh, open subset of R P, omega, which is an open subset of R P. Now, P here uh, is the. So I'm using D for the dimension variable. So. I, uh, earlier we were uh, dealing with 1D systems. Now I'll be extending it to multi-dimensional systems. I won't be even fixing it to 3D. It's it's going to be multi-dimensional. So I'm D is the number of dimensions now. And P is my uh, number of equations. That is a number of simultaneous equations that we need to solve. So in a, in a given system, for example, in 1D Euler's equations, Rp is 3. So we have mass, momentum, and energy. For 2D Euler's system, we have one mass conservation and two momentum conservations and one energy. So P becomes 4. For uh, 3D, it becomes 5. So P is uh, 5 for 3D Euler's equation, and uh, it is D is 3 for 3D Euler's equation. So this is the case. So in this space Rp, a uh, real number space, uh, R3 is something, a three dimensional coordinate system. Rp is like P dimensional coordinate, Cartesian coordinate system. So in this uh, space Rp, we can consider some open subset omega. So all our solutions, u, u vector. Now u vector is the solution. U, we have uh, u1, u2 up to up. So this is a vector. Now u vector is the solution conserved variable vector and fj vector is the flux of the conserved variable vector. Um, j, j is used to uh, index the dimension variable and uh, each, of, each of the fj's have uh, p components. And these are flux functions, flux vectors corresponding to the conserved variable vector. And we consider the flux vectors to be smooth functions from omega into Rp. So our solution U actually lies in omega, which is a subset of Rp. And our function Fj's are functions of Fj's are functions of U. So Fj's are uh, taken from omega into Rp. So that's what I have written as Fj are smooth functions from omega into Rp. And uh, we are considering this general form of a system of conservation loss. Now, this is the equation here. X vector runs uh, has components up to x1, x2, up to xd. This belongs to Rd space, and t is 
t is greater than 0 this t belongs to r plus only r1 plus plus in the sense just positive side of the real line so this is how we uh, this is the system that we'll be considering from now on so uh, earlier we just considered dou u by dou t plus dou by dou x phi equals 0 here phi is rx f okay so it's the same thing but just that u is now a vector phi is a vector and i am taking x also to be a d x is a d dimensional vector phi is phi and u are p dimensional vectors so that's the difference so it's the same thing extrapolated to multiple dimensions and uh, multiple equations now this is this equation one is in conservative form I mean, because uh, we say that uh, we derived the conservative uh, we went through the integral form of conservation law and we, from that we obtained the pde so that's we call that pde as the conservation law itself so which means that in that pde u gets conserved in some domain and uh, phi is the flux of the conserved variable which uh, moves across the domain uh, moves across the surface of the domain so here uh, this equation is also of the same form so you so this equation is said to be in conservative form so in this equation we can treat u vector to be as a uh, to be the conserved variable and fj vector of u vector to be the flux of the conserved variable this equation one actually expresses conservation of all the p quantities u and u2 up to up u vector has p components and all the p components are getting conserved in each of the equations respectively like corresponding to their equation I mean, corresponding to equation one in the system u1 will be conserved corresponding to equation two u will u2 will be conserved and so on so now uh, in let us simply consider an arbitrary domain of rd ma'am yes sir I just had a doubt. I uh, just wanted to ask. Yeah. Um, uh, exactly, exactly where you are pointing. Um, here there is an equation where uh, u is a function of x and t, basically uh, spatial dimensions and time, and um, f is a function of u. So of course it will all also be a uh, function yeah. of um, x and spatial x. coordinates and time. Yeah. Now the question I had was. Uh, there are various conservation laws like mass conservation as well as uh, momentum and uh, energy conservation. In uh, solution, I am coming from Navier-Stokes equation uh, solution part of it. Um, will, won't, will there be any dependence or interdependence of these equations? Are you, uh, can you show some light on it, throw some light on it? The equations are dependent on each other actually. So suppose if we consider mass conservation and uh, let's go to the simple Euler's equation, macroscopic Euler's equation without the invisible part. Hmm. So I've written mass, momentum and energy conservation equations here. So um, we can see that uh, rows, uh, if we do an update for mass conservation equation, we are actually going to find rho in the next time step. So rho is basically the output and uh, u becomes the input for mass conservation. Using uh, this input, a rho will be found as output. And uh, in this momentum conservation, uh, u becomes the output. Essentially rho u, but since we have rho from the mass conservation itself, that uh, we'll be using it here. It will not necessarily be the output. P and uh, rho, uh, P rho and u, again, they become the input. U is actually input and output for mo momentum conservation. Energy conservation, E becomes the output. Here again, P rho and uh, E is E and P are actually functions of each other. So uh, we can just consider one of them. So we can say P is the output here. And uh, here again, P becomes the input, rho, U, everything becomes the input. So we can see that uh, input from one equation is used 
uh, output from one equation is used as an input to another equation to find some other variable as an output. So they are these all, all of these equations will be interdependent on each other. So we have to solve them simultaneously. Thank you, ma'am. OK, is, is this is was this the question, sir? Exactly. Okay. That was exactly the question. Thank okay. you. OK, OK, sir. So we need to solve all the equations uh, together. We, we cannot separate them out and solve them independently. So that is why we are looking into systems of conservation loss. Otherwise, uh, the theory that we have developed for scalar conservation loss itself would be sufficient to actually go about solving each of the equations in the system independently. But since the equations are dependent on each other, we need to develop some theory for systems of conservation loss where all the equations are uh, I mean where the variables are actually interdependent inside the equations. So to go further, let us consider some uh, arbitrary domain in the RD space and uh, n vector be the outward unit normal to the boundary OD of T. So now let's say in simple R2 space, this will be simply like some domain will be considered. This will be D and this domain will have uh, this will be dou D. Dou D will be the outer surface. That is the boundary of the domain and uh, the boundary we, we can construct a normal to the boundary at every point actually. So at each point the normal will be different. So we can construct some normal vector which itself is a variable dependent on the domain boundary of the domain and such a normal vector exists for any arbitrary domain. So let us just define such a normal vector and then uh, now let us go back to our equation one which is our system of conservation laws. Uh, we can now integrate that over the whole domain D. So this is that I've been I've done integration of the PDE over the domain D which uh, here the integration variable will be dx vector. So now this integral is being taken into the derivative because uh, we are considering a fixed domain. So the integral is now being taken inside uh, the derivative. And this part is just directly written as such. Here a uh, Gauss divergence theorem has been applied. So Gauss divergence theorem is simply like uh, divergence of F dv over the volume space is becomes F dot n ds. Uh, in, in a simple way, if I do d, let it be dv, it's over the domain and it's over the boundary of the domain. A uh, volume integral has been uh, one dimension has been reduced at exactly. So the uh, domain it was d was our domain initially. Oh, integral over the whole domain D has now been uh, trans transformed into an integral over just the surface of the outer boundary of the domain do omega. This is Gauss divergence theorem. So this has been applied over here. So F dot N is nothing but FJ into NJ and uh, divergence of F is do by do XJ into FJ, do by do XJ of FJ. So uh, this has been uh, uh, this Domain integral over the domain D has been transformed into an integral over domain dou D. Essentially, so uh, now we can notice that this is actually the integral form of conservation loss. This is basically our integral form for the systems of conservation system. Of We started with a PDE and we have formed an integral form for the system of conservation loss. Uh, this is something we have seen a similar uh, uh, analog of that we have seen for the scalar case as well. Uh, for the scalar case, we started with dou u by dou t plus dou phi by dou x equals zero. And we got in as an integral form, we got d by dt of integral u dx plus phi dot n. Uh, this, if I have 
this over different variables say j equals 1 to d then it will be 5 vector dot n vector ts equals 0 so this a similar analog of this integ system integral form for systems we saw in the scalar case as well so now that we have seen the pde and the integral a system of pdes and the integral form for the system of pdes uh, let us move on to defining uh, the hyperbolicity for the system of PDEs. We saw hyperbolicity, uh, we call some PDE as a concept, just if in the scalar case, we call some PDE as a hyperbolic PDE if it has uh, real and distinct characteristics. Similarly, for the system of conservation loss, when do we call the system as hyperbolic? So that is the question. So let us try to answer that. So for that, uh, now for all, uh, let us look, and look at the matrix AJ of U. AJ of U is just the derivative of, uh, we had different fluxes, right? FJs. FJs are functions of U vectors. FJ, FJ has component P components and U vector itself has P components. So uh, derivative of dou by dou U vector of FJ vector of U. This will be simply uh, dou f1 by dou u1. And so on. Like, this will be this matrix. This is for one single J, essentially. This or for J. These F1, F2s are components of this matrix. I'm simply writing this as something like this. I'm taking this G J suffix from all of them and writing it outside. That's it. So uh, this uh, vector has now been in, uh, differentiated with respect to U vector. So basically, uh, I'm doing dou by dou U1, dou by dou U2 up to dou by dou u key, this operation on uh, this f1, f2 up to fp corresponding to the jth dimension. So this operation gives us this matrix. So that is what is our uh, AJ, AJ matrices. So we call for each dimension, we have different matrices for j equal, for all j equals one, up, I mean for j between j and one up to d. We have AJs to be defined as these matrices. These are the Jacobian matrix, mat, uh, matrices of FJs. And now we call the system one as hyperbolic if for any U in omega and any W in RD space, W vector is some any general vector from RD space. And, and that W vector should not be equal to Z. It cannot be a zero vector, but it can be any any other vector. For that, uh, for such a construction, if we construct some matrix to be A of U vector comma W vector as this, this is simply uh, W1 A1 plus W2 A2 up to different dimensions essentially. For 2D, it will cut, it will be st stopping till here. For 3D, we'll have one more term. That's, uh, it, it, we will be taking this matrix a1, a2, a3 are matrices themselves and w1s are just components w1, w2 up to wd are components of a random vector in rd. So we are taking an arbitrary vector in rd and uh, each of those com each of the uh, com components of that uh, random arbitrary vector is now uh, uh, done a scale uh, scalar product of that arbitrary vector arbitrary component of it. Okay, we are doing a simple scalar product of uh, this these components with our matrices A1, A2 up to AD and uh, we are just summing that up. That is our new matrix A. Now, if this new matrix has uh, real eigenvalues, it, uh, we can now evaluate eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this new matrix. And if this matrix has P real eigenvalues, if it has p real eigenvalues, then of course we can do some ordering because all real numbers can be ordered. So if they are just p real eigenvalues, we can order them in some way. 
so that ordering has been done here so lambda 1 less than or equal to lambda 2 up to lambda p and if it has p linearly independent corresponding eigenvectors for each of these eigenvalues if we have linearly uh, if we have we will be having some corresponding eigenvectors and if those eigenvectors are linearly independent then for sure we can construct such an eigenvalue problem in that case uh, the system is hyperbolic. Our equation, our system of conservation laws is hyperbolic. If we construct such a matrix A with some arbitrary vector, this has to hold for all or arbitrary vectors in R D. If I, even for one vector it's not holding, then uh, we cannot proceed further. So uh, we should construct uh, this real eigenvalues should exist for any arbitrary vector W. In that case, the system will be hyperbolic. And also if lambdas are all distinct, earlier I told just real, if they are both real and distinct, then we call the system to be strictly hyperbolic. So that is, uh, that is it. So now the system of conservation loss is hyperbolic. We have defined the hyperbolicity for our system of conservation loss. Similarly, parabolicity is uh, like uh, at least one of the eigenvalues is zero. Then uh, then we call the system to be parabolic and elliptic is like one of the eigenvalues is imaginary then the system is elliptic we are mainly focused on hyperbolic systems so uh, i have uh, defined hyperbolicity in a proper manner here i'm not going into the details of ellipticity and uh, parabolicity of systems of conservation laws now let us see some examples for uh, the systems of conservation loss. So let us look at the mass, momentum, and energy conservation equations. So this is the three-dimensional in a 3D domain. So this becomes the mass conservation and momentum conservation. Here uh, we have UI. So this holds for uh, three different i's. I lies between one and three. So this equation is actually three equations here, written in initial notation as one equation. And this is energy conservation equation. So we have five equations essentially, or five different equations. Now we can uh, simply uh, call, uh, we can interpret this as a system of conservation law of our earlier form, like in the form that we stated earlier. Uh, rows are density and uh, u vector is the velocity. Uh, instead of taking u vector, I, I, I'll simply write this as a system of conservation loss. So this will be simply rho u1, rho u2, rho u3, and rho u. So similarly, you'll have uh, three other, two more flux terms. And a zero vector here. So uh, this is our variable uh, u vector that we defined earlier. And this is f1 vector of u vector. And this will be f2 vector of u vector. And this will be our F3 vector of U vector, essentially. So this um, uh, Euler's system of equations can be treated as an equivalent of systems of conservation laws. Now, uh, for if we construct matrices is for each of them, AJ, so we can construct A1 as do F1 by do U. This will be a matrix. Similarly, we can construct A2 and A3 as do F2 by do U and do F3 by do U. So these will be three matrices. Now from these, we can construct the matrix A that I told earlier with an arbitrary vector essentially. So that will become W1 A1 plus W2 A2 plus W3 A3. So now uh, 
this metric for this matrix we can find real eigen uh, we can find eigen values and eigen vectors and see if they are real and distinct so in that case we can argue about their hyperbolicity hyperbolicity of the full system of equations uh, so this is it I've just uh, written the same thing, but the notations here might be different because I'm taking u vector as just the velocity vector. But in our previous notations, our u vector is the full system of full conserved variable vector with rho and rho e included as well. So just the notations are going to be different here. So u vector is the velocity, p is pressure, and e is a specific total energy, which is the sum of internal and kinetic energies. And kinetic energy is given by this expression. And equation of state is uh, just we are taking some general equation of state for a simple form of that will be for a polytropic ideal gas it will be of this form. So now uh, I'm calling QI as some simply rho UI and uh, a new notation for rho E. So the same thing has been rewritten and uh, with different notations here. And now uh, this omega this becomes our u vector which I have written over here this full conserved variable vector so it consists of rho q vector and this new variable so this will be the conserved variable vector here such that uh, but uh, in the con in the macroscopic system we have some restrictions over density and uh, internal energy so that is density and internal energy they both must be positive all the time so I'm putting those restrictions also. So omega is some open subset consisting of this these vectors which satisfy this criteria. It is rho must be greater than zero and internal energy must be greater than zero. So this becomes the open subset omega which we started with earlier. I told our u vector belongs to omega. So for 1D Euler's, uh, for 3D Euler system, uh, it becomes of this form. So omega is any vector Omega is any in, in the subset Omega, all vectors that satisfy this criteria uh, will be included. So this is our solution space essentially. Now as an exercise, you can try showing that 1D invisible gas dynamics system is strictly hyperbolic and 2D system is hyperbolic. So you just need to find out these matrices and uh, try to uh, argue about uh, construct this matrix and find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and argue about their hyperbolicity based on that and uh, but these w's have to be arbitrary but even after finding the eigenvalues you'll be having these variables w1 w2 w3 and all but for if if you can notice that like let's say if your let's say your one of your eigenvalues is something like uh, um, W1 itself, W1 into some rho plus. I'm just simply writing this is not actually any eigenvalue. Uh, this is not the real eigenvalue at all. So uh, if you have some variable here, W1 into some variable of your system, uh, we can see if this, if you find this to be real all the time, then. Uh, you can say that for for all values of w1 this is now going to be real so you can argue about the hyperbolicity using this the only thing is if for any particular value of uh, w1 if uh, your lambda lambda seem to be imaginary or something of that sort then the system is not hyperbolic otherwise the system is going to be hyperbolic So this is with uh, and this is an, a basic introduction to system of conservation laws. So we have seen uh, the system of PDs, which is the system of conservation laws itself. And then we constructed the integral form of the system of conservation laws first. Then we argued about the hyperbolicity of the system of conservation laws. Now um, let us try to construct an additional conservation law to the system of conservation laws. So Earlier uh, we saw entropy condition, so this uh, is something that will 
give us some background to study entropy conservation entropy conditions for systems of conservation laws so this additional conservation law i'm call will be an entropy conservation law or entropy inequality accordingly but for now it's going to be a conservation law itself because uh, we are going to deal with only smooth solutions in smooth regions your entropy gets conserved so uh, for euler's equations at least so um, additional uh, conservation law to the system of conservation law help, will help us in going towards entropy conditions for the system of conservation laws uh, that will be seeing in the next class but today we'll give a background for that this uh, we'll form a, we'll see what is this additional conservation law first um, any doubts up till here Any doubts? Um, Ma'am, I just had a clarification. Um, in the differential equations, we have parabolic, elliptical, and hyperbolic uh, equations mm. uh, based on their auxiliary equation, auxiliary equation of a uh, differential equation. So, is that similar to the hyperbolicity you are talking about, or uh, these are slightly different with yeah. related to eigenvalues? Uh, actually eigenvalues uh, this is with related to eigenvalues but eigenvalues help us in relating the systems to scalar like uh, because eigen if we have eigen vectors we can decom uh, decouple the system earlier we discussed about how the equations are coupled with each other in the system now eigen if we have linearly independent eigen vectors we can uh, do eigenvalue decomposition and then decompose the system uh, into separate equations. That is now uh, we can, in the system, the e equations may be uh, independent of each other if we have linearly independent eigenvectors. We can construct a system where the equations are actually inter uh, not uh, dependent on each other any further. So that will be characteristic variable form. You know? So right now, uh, when we do that, the each of the equations will behave like uh, scalar hyperbolic equations in this case if they if we if they have real eigenvalues and distinct i uh, i real and uh, real eigenvalues and linearly independent eigenvectors then uh, each of these equations in our uh, system can be transformed into a different set of equations where uh, where the variables are go where the each of the equations are going to be independent of each other in the new new tra after transformation so there, each equation will behave like a scalar equation itself, a scalar hyperbolic equation itself. So they are related to each other, in, but in eigenvalues will help us relating the systems to scalar case. Understood, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. Mm. So, yeah. Any further questions? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So I'll start with uh, the additional conservation law. Um, we have this uh, PDE again. Consider this system of conservation laws. The PDE. Ma system PDE. Sorry, ma'am. I'm okay. not able to see your screen. Okay. Is it the case for everybody? Uh, no, ma'am. Your screen is visible to us. Okay. Okay, ma'am. I I think I'll log out and log in again. Okay. Okay, so we'll wait until then. Okay. I think now it is visible. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay, so. so. So this is our system of PDEs, which is given by equation one, and uh, the initial condition is given over here. Again, x belongs to the RD space, and um, u belongs to omega, which is a subset of RP, and uh, t is t belongs to R plus, and fjs belong to RP again. Fjs are functions of u vector. So this is our uh, initial value problem, which we saw earlier. Now, uh, for this uh, system of PDEs, we again we can have classical solution. We earlier we saw classical solution for uh, scalar conservation laws. Now again, let's 
a seed for the systems of conservation loss. So here uh, u vector uh, from Rd into omega. So u vector is a function of x comma t. So it's from Rd cross zero comma infinity to this is for x vector. X vector lies here and t, t lies here. So u from Rd cross zero comma infinity into omega. So it is a classical solution. If uh, if u vector satisfies some properties, first of all, it must be continuous and its derivatives must exist and derivatives must be continuous for all t and for all xj's, where j belongs to one up to d. And uh, you met u vector must satisfy the PDE, which is given by the system one and initial condition, which is given by this equation two. This is PDE. This is our PDE and uh, this is our initial condition. So. Uh, our u vector must satisfy both the PDE and initial condition and the derivatives must exist and they must be continuous. This is this definition is the same as the one uh, we had for the scalar case. Um, so this is a classical solution for system of PDEs. Now let us uh, define the mathematical notion of entropy first. Uh, what is additional conservation law? So, First of all, will any classical solution satisfy an additional conservation law of this new form? So where uh, this capital U is a function from uh, omega into R. So it's a function of U vector. So this is this conservative solution itself, solution vector. So this capital U is a function of our solution vector and uh, these FJs are also functions of uh, solution vectors. Later we will interpret this U as entropy function and this fj as entropy flux functions. Right now, uh, we are not going into that interpretation. So let, we are just seeing whether such a u and f can exist for any classical solution u vector of the system of conservation loss. So fjs are sufficiently smooth. They can be differentiated any num as many number of times as we want. So. Uh, now this uh, equation three can exist if this is satisfied. That is if uh, u prime of u dot fj prime of u is capital fj prime of u vector. So this u prime of u is uh, this new function. It's this u only. So dou u by dou u vector dot producted with dou by dou u vector of fj vector. This will be dou by dou u vector of fj vector. fj is not, this capital fj is not a vector. It's a scalar. So this capital U and capital fj are scalars, whereas small u and small f are vectors from the system of conservation loss. U, the small u vector is the conserved variable vector and small fj vectors are the flux vectors in the system. So when we do this differentiation, we'll get a matrix. This we, this is something which we saw earlier in the last slide. And uh, dou u by dou u vector, this will give a vector. This vector is of this form, essentially. Dou u by dou u vector is this one. And uh, this matrix, dou by dou u vector of fj vector is this matrix. And uh, this is again a vector, dou by dou u vector of fj. This is a vector. So when you dot product uh, this vector and, and this matrix, you will get another vector and that vector should be this vector. So if that happens, then this uh, new equation, equation three can exist. We'll see why. So we have, we started with the system, right? Equ system one. So let us just have that system over here. So that system is basically this only. So I'm just multiplying that by dou u by dou u vector. So dot left dot product to me essentially. So I'm doing dot product of the system one with uh, dou u by dou u vector, which is this vector. So when you do that, uh, before doing, uh, I have done that and this part can be interpreted as something like this. Dou by dou xj of fj vector of u vector can be written as dou by dou u vector of fj vector of u vector into dou u, by, dou u vector by dou xj. This is basically the matrix that I told earlier, dou, u, dou by dou u vector of fj vector. Excuse me. Okay. 
so um, this becomes the matrix this part so this is the matrix that we have over here so now if we do dot product the left this term is has been written just like that and uh, this uh, u prime of u vector can be taken inside this summation because this summation runs over j only and this u prime of u vector doesn't have any index j so it can be taken inside so u prime of u vector dot fj prime of u vector this becomes fj prime of u vector since this is true i can replace uh, this term by this thing over here and that dot product with dou u by dou xj this becomes a dou by dou xj of fj of u vector and this becomes uh, this is essentially a dou by dou u vector of uh, u dot dou by dou t of u vector so this becomes dou by dou t of u of u vector so that is this term so essentially by dot producting uh, the system of conservation laws with this dou u by dou u vector we get this additional conservation law provided this condition is satisfied so this is a necessary condition for us to get this additional conservation law for any function u uh, if there exists some fj that satisfies this property then uh, uh, the additional conservation law can exist for a system of conservation laws corresponding to the function u so so just uh, this is something to be noted that is just if this condition is satisfied for any function u and correspondingly fj capital fj of u vectors then uh, this additional conservation law will exist now let us move on to the definition of entropy um, for that uh, let us uh, just cons uh, assume that omega is a convex set uh, which means that uh, convex set in the sense um, uh, let's say in, uh, in two dimensions uh, let's say something is like this so if this is some set like the some set in uh, a region so now if you consider two points in the set uh, if you are able to draw a line between these two points uh, between uh, between these two points and that all the points in that line all the points in this line must also lie in this convex set so for example uh, uh, if you have uh, let me just draw something like this let me just draw some set like this now now if i cons consider these two points between these two points i cannot draw a line such that all the points in the line will lie in this convex set because there are there will always be some points these points which are lying outside this set so such a set is not convex so between any two points in the set if you are able to draw a line such that all the points in that line also lie in that convex in that set then that set is called convex set so this is something we this is some uh, thing we take uh, now right now let let uh, the importance of taking convexity will come uh, when we discuss about the weak form of systems of systems of conservation laws and uh, con thereby constructing entropy inequalities and all right now uh, uh, we won't see any importance of having convex function in this lecture but in the next lecture we'll be uh, seeing how why taking convex function is important uh, so right now let us say that it's just going to be convex so for now uh, let us say omega is a convex set and there is a convex function u from omega into r this con function also is now treated as convex function this function this, this is a scalar function that is real valued function it, it takes input as u vector this is simply u of u vector which we saw earlier so a function is called convex if uh, dou squared u by dou u squared this will be a matrix now do do u by do u vector this is a vector 
do by do u vector of do u by do u vector this will be a matrix and if this matrix has is positive definite then the function is function u is convex we call function u as convex if this matrix is positive definite positive definite in the sense it has uh, positive eigen values so we we'll see the importance of it later uh, we are right now let us say that use convex use a convex function and omega is a convex set so now we call uh, u as an entropy for the system of conservation loss 1 if there exists some d functions fj fj these are entropy flux functions uh, such that four holes four was this thing u of u vector dot fj prime of u vector this must be equal to fj prime of u vector so if this is true then uh, use for any u which is an which is for any convex function u if there exists some fjs that satisfy four then that u is an entropy function and fjs are entropy flux functions so this is the definition of entropy for a system of conservation loss now any classical function of one classical function is a function we saw the definition of classical function for the system of conservation loss so any classical function will satisfy the additional conservation law we saw it like we started with a classical function we started the definition of additional conservation law by using a classical uh, solution essentially because we assumed that a uh, u vector is a classical solution for the pd then only the pd is true then uh, we have this uh, we construct this function capital u of u vector and for such a function if uh, some this condition is satisfied then we'll have entropy fun flux functions as well and then thereby we'll have entropy the additional conservation law or entropy conservation law as we'll see further so any classical function will satisfy any classical solution to the system of conservation laws will satisfy the additional conservation law or the entropy conservation law but this is not true of a general weak solution for the system of conservation laws because uh, the weak solution will not satisfy the pd at all and we derived this uh, entropy conservation additional conservation law from the pd only system of pds so it's not guaranteed that a weak solution will satisfy the entropy conservation law or the additional conservation law but all classical solutions will satisfy the additional conservation law a general i told that it is a general weak solution but in particular it can also be considered as a piece by c1 weak solution this is something which we saw in the scalar case where when the solution breaks down we constructed piece by solutions which are actually weak solutions to the system a system or scalar conservation law whatever now uh, the question is can possible entropy functions for a nonlinear system of conservation laws be found like for given given any nonlinear system of conservation laws will it always be possible for us to find uh, the entropy functions will there exist entropy function always first of all for any general system of conservation laws so that is a question we need to answer for scalar case it is true for scalar case where p equals 1 any uh, we are taking p was our number of uh, equations in the system earlier now i'm taking that p to be 1 when p is 1 it becomes the scalar system scalar conservation law itself so for scalar case when p equals 1 any convex function u from omega into r is an entropy function because uh, it's entropy function is something we are calling as a convex function and it is a con it should be a convex function and it also should satisfy this criteria u prime of u dot f prime of u equals f prime of u so basically for a scalar case is just going to be one equation uh, we'll simply have um, do u by do, do u dot let me say uh, i have something like do u by do t plus, this is a scalar case and uh, let me uh, say i have a convex function now 
uh, function that is convex in the xt plane. So now for this convex function, uh, I need to find some f prime, capital F prime basically. So if you, if you it's always possible to have convex function in some domain. If a function is convex, then uh, you can take that function, then you can uh, find the derivative of that function u prime of u, and you can also find f prime of u uh, dot product with that. Then call that as capital F prime of u. Now, in order to find f, just integrate uh, this f prime of u. Now you have found the entropy flux function. So. So u is now your entropy function and f is the entropy flux function. This is for a simple scalar case when p equals 1. So when p equals 1, if a function is convex, then that function is always an entropy function for your scalar conservation law. So for the scalar case, all convex functions will be entropy functions. And corresponding to that entropy function, we can always find entropy flux function by using this method. So we can always do this process and find out this f prime of u and thereby we can integrate and find out f. So uh, we can always for any convex any convex function uh, will be an entropy function for scalar case. But for general systems of conservation loss when p is greater than 1, um, this equation 4 that is uh, u prime of u dot fj prime of u, fj is now a vector, u prime of u vector will be fj prime of capital fj prime of u vector. So now this trans uh, results in a, a system of p cross d linear PDEs of first order. That is we can see that for we will have different equations now because fj's are like we have fj runs from 1 to d okay so we have d equations essentially from this itself we can see that this equation can be written as d equations now we have d equations and uh, also we'll have uh, each of these d uh, we we are having d number of equations now and each of these d equations will have uh, p terms because uh, Derivative is being taken with respect to u. U vector again has p components. So each of these are things will have p terms. This variable k, do f i j by do u k. The derivative is taken with respect to k. And also here fj's are differentiated with respect to k. So uh, again we have p terms. So we have p cross d linear PDEs of first order. And the number of unknowns is d plus 1 because we need to find u and fj both. Not It's not just u. We need to find both u and fj. FJ F, for fj, we have d unknowns and u is one more unknown. So we have d plus 1 unknowns. We, need, we have d plus 1 unknowns and uh, p cross d number of pds. So... Uh, it's a it's a system now. This itself is a system of PDEs with d plus one unknowns. Let's just say in a simple algebraic system, and an, uh, or just to say why sometimes solution may not exist for this p cross d linear system. Uh, let's say we have a simple algebraic system, say x plus y equals one and x plus y equals two. And let me also have two x plus two y equals Two. Now these two equations are same. They uh, just become x plus y equals 1 and uh, x plus y equals 2. Now these two equations are completely oppose each other. Uh, one, one is actually, uh, they are not the same. They are actually parallel lines. They don't have any intersection at all. And also they oppose each other. In one equation we say x plus y is something and in another equation x plus y is something else. So basically this system has no solution at all. So just in algebraic uh, system, we can construct uh, a system such that uh, for, there can be no solution at all. In this case also, there is po it is possible that uh, there need not be any solution at all at times. So this uh, thing can have some solution, need not have some solution, anything is possible. 
So um, for uh, a general case where P is greater than one, entropy functions may or may not exist. So existence of entropy functions for a general uh, system of conservation laws is itself a special property of that particular system. So for Euler system and all, we have entropy function that satisfies this criteria for Euler's system, for inviscid Euler's equations, or mass, momentum, and energy conservation equations. For that system, which we considered in the last slide, uh, we have entropy function. We know that uh, we know that there is an entropy function. The uh, thermodynamical entropy function itself is, can be uh, obtained as this obtained through this definition also. So this itself is a special property. In practical examples derived from mechanics and physics, that's what uh, for some most of the practical examples, we are able to derive entropy functions that have physical meaning, entropy functions that satisfy this criteria. Although in a general case where general case entropy functions need not exist, entropy functions may or may not exist essentially. So. Uh, but in some uh, practical examples, we have uh, situations where entropy functions exist and they do have some meaning. Any doubts until here? No, ma'am. Okay, okay. So I'll continue. Now, uh, let me just give an example of asymmetric systems of conservation laws. So uh, as of now, we have seen uh, an additional conservation law. We saw with, we started with system of conservation laws and we saw integral form of that and we saw hyperbolicity of that. Then uh, we went on to seeing a classical solution for the system of conservation laws. And uh, we saw that uh, from the classical solution, we obtained those additional conservation law, essentially. So all classical solutions of the PDE will uh, satisfy the additional conservation law if it exists. So additional conservation law may or may not exist. For scalar case, it always exists. For a, a general system of conservation laws where P is greater than one, Additional conservation law may or may not exist depending on the solvability of the entropy condition that we stated. That is u prime of u dot fj prime of u equals FJ, capital fj prime of u vector. So depending on the solvability of that, the additional conservation law may, may or may not exist. <coughs> so now uh, let me give an importance for of the sy symmetric systems of conservation laws. So for the system of conservation laws, assume that our P cross P matrices, that is AJ matrices are all symmetric. AJ matrices that we obtain after differentiating uh, the FJ vectors, flux vectors with respect to the conserved variable vector. So accordingly, we get these matrices AJ. So suppose for now, let us assume that those matrices are all symmetric. In general case, they need not be symmetric. For now, let us assume that they are symmetric. In that case, uh, basically, this AJ, uh, AJ is being symmetric essentially means this like uh, it's based uh, do F IJ by do UK. Of course, uh, these FJ primes are uh, matrices given by something like this. Fj prime. First, I'll just write Fj prime. Fj, just for the sake of completion, we have seen this earlier. And u vectors. Uh, I'm writing it to be so. Now my do Fj by do u vector will be. This matrix 
and this suffix j. So uh, here in this notation, I have used j at the end. Uh, the, after f, I have used two indices, ij, ij and k. Uh, first index is used to denote these terms, f1 up to fp. And the second index, j, is used to denote this uh, j, basically. So do fj, this j. So j actually runs from 1 to d. Whereas i and k, they run from uh, 1 to p. So if, if we assume this matrix to be symmetric, this is aj, right? If you assume this matrix to be symmetric, which means that do f i by do u k equals do f k by do u i for the same j. Solve the same j. For the same j, this is j matrix. Do f i by do u k equals do f k by do u i. If uh, symmetricity of this matrix implies this. So that's what is written over here in this place. So I've used another index j over here just in order to uh, say which uh, dimension it is. Like, to indicate the dimension of the system. So I have do f i j by do u k equals do f k j by do u i. So here i and k go from lie between 1 and p and j lies between 1 and d. So if, you are, if we assume a j is to be symmetric, this is the case. This will be the case. Now uh, these relations actually uh, prove, uh, say that there can be a function g j such that this is true. Uh, this is this this we can see it evidently because suppose let's say f i j is some function do uh, is some is equal to do g do g j by do u i. Now differentiate this with u k. Differentiate this thing with respect to u k. Now we, on the right hand side we get do f i j by do u k, which is essentially the right uh, left hand side here. And uh, on on the here we have something like this. So this is basically do square gj by do uk do ui. We know that order of differentiation is always uh, interchangeable. So doing do square by do x do y is equal to do, doing do square by do y do x. So order of differentiation is always interchangeable. So uh, this essentially means that this is also true. This, they are both equivalent. So, and this part, do square gj by do uk do ui is equal to do fij by do uk, whereas do square gj by do ui do uk is equal to do fkj by do ui. So, they are both equal. So, is the, which is actually true, which is actually the thing that we wanted to say. So, if, if existence of such a thing, that is, a, a, Symmetricity of uh, AJ matrices uh, say that some functions GJ can exist such that do GJ by do UI is FIJ. So this symmetricity becomes the compatibility condition for existence of some function GJ such that this relation holds. Uh, I, uh, I, is it clear? Any doubts here? It's clear, ma'am. Okay, okay, sir. Yeah. So, this is how symmetricity of um, AJs imply the existence of some new functions GJ such so that this condition holds. Okay. So now, uh, let us move on further. Like, for such a system, for us such a system where the AJs are symmetric, this becomes a strictly convex function. We have a theorem here for such a system. The strictly convex function u of u vector, which is just half into summation of u i squared over i, is an entropy function for the symmetric system. And also the associated entropy fluxes are given by these expressions. We'll see how this is true. So first of all, um, we know that GJs exist. 
we argued the ex about the existence of GJ right now. So uh, since AJs are symmetric, uh, this condition is true. And since this condition is true, there exists GJ such that this relation holds. So now uh, GJs are some functions. I'm differentiating GJs with respect to XJs. This is essentially uh, dou gj by dou ui into dou ui by dou xj summed over i. And dou gj by dou ui is our fij as we saw earlier. So I'm replacing it by fij. So this is something we have. Dou by dou xj of gj is summed over, sum over i of fij dou, by, dou ui by dou xj. So now this is one thing. Let us keep this for now. Now let us look at the uh, uh, derivative of entropy flux that is fj uh, fj again can be fj we took as this term right this part let us substitute that over here for now in place of uh, actually we are substituting this in place of fj's so do by do xj of ui Okay, we'll be getting dou by dou xj of, I've skipped a step over there. Sum over i. So this is something we'll have and uh, we can interchange the summation with uh, summation and differentiation because summation runs over i, whereas differentiation is with respect to j, so it's okay to interchange. Uh, so after doing that, we get dou by dou xj of, uh, when we do that, we'll be getting something like uh, summation over i, dou by dou xj of ui, fij of u vector, minus uh, dou by dou xj gj of u vector. This is something that we evaluated earlier as uh, sum of i equals 1 to p fij dou ui by dou xj. That is being substituted over here. Whereas uh, this part, they are doing chain root. So uh, first ui, chain, in, when we do chain rule, we get uh, first dou ui by dou xj into fij plus uh, ui dou by dou xj fij. So that is something which is written over here. Those two terms after chain rule and uh, this term dou by dou xj gj is written as some uh, in terms of fij over here. So we have three terms and these two terms will cancel out. They are same and the, this will be the remaining part sum over so i ui dou by dou xj of fij. So now I'll just erase this. Okay. So is it here up till here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So now uh, let us substitute this in the additional conservation law that we had. So u is, written, u is now taken as this uh, half of sum, oops, sum of ui squared. So that when we do differentiate with respect to time, we'll get this term. And uh, dou by dou xj, fj, we just evaluated it as this term. So I'm just substituting it here. So now ui can be taken common from either of these terms and we'll end up getting ui into uh, this this part. So this is basically zero. This is our system of conservation law itself. Just uh, in, in there is just an index i. Our system of conservation law was some something like this. So these were vectors. F j and u were vectors. Instead of that, we are using initial notation here. So these have p components, both f j and u j. So I, instead of that, we have u i and f i j. So i runs from one to p. So this is just the same thing in initial notation. Uh, this 
this is a vector notation whereas this is an initial notation of the same equation so this is equal to 0 so hence this additional conservation law becomes equal to 0 so so thereby we get this so if we take u as this function and fj as this function then uh, the, this additional conservation law is getting satisfied. It's becoming equal to zero. So uh, if the if AJs are symmetric, if the matrices are symmetric, then we have entropy and entropy flux functions that satisfy the additional conservation law. This is a takeaway that we need from here. So now uh, it's just that if the system is symmetric, we always have entropy and entropy flux functions. And the entropy function will be of this form and entropy flux function will be of this form. There can also exist other entropy functions. This is one of the entropy functions that can exist. We are not saying that this function will be unique, but this is one of the entropy functions that uh, results in formation of additional entropy conservation law. Now let's move on to uh, the general case for any general system of conservation laws without assuming the symmetricity of the matrices. Now, uh, here again, use a strictly convex function um, and a necessary and uh, sufficient condition for uh, you to be an entropy function for the system of conservation laws is that uh, these matrices u double prime dot fj prime of u must be symmetric. So we'll see why this has to be true first of all. So for any general system of conservation laws, we earlier saw that u prime of u vector dot fj prime of u vector equals capital fj prime of u vector. So this is the necessary condition for existence of entropy and entropy flux functions. But now uh, uh, we are they are saying that u double prime of u dot fj prime of u must be symmetric we will say that this and this are equivalent that is from this we can obtain this and from this we can obtain this from one we can imply other we can we will show both equivalence from both the sides essentially this uh, in this proof we will be trying that only so now uh, we will do the proof for that so u is strictly convex that is uh, uh, I told that strictly convex means dou squared u by dou u vector squared must be positive definite. That is this matrix. Dou squared u by dou u vector squared is this matrix and it must be symmetric. It, it will always be symmetric essentially because differentiation is getting, being carried out. It will always be symmetric. You can see that in this system, the terms here and here are essentially same because order of differentiation is interchangeable. This matrix is going to be always symmetric. And it's a uh, positive definite for if, if it's convex, if u is strictly convex, then this matrix will be positive definite. So we from this assumption of strict convexity, we get these two inferences. And we are first assuming that u is an entropy function, which means that this condition will be satisfied. That is this holds. So now this is true from this. Let us try to get the symmetricity condition u double prime dot fj prime is symmetric. So uh, now let us differentiate this equation with respect to ul. So which is here. So I'll just write this over here. I'm writing the same thing in initial notation, not for convenience, essentially. So this is the condition for in initial notation. I'm differentiating this with respect to UL now. So when we do that, this term will become dou squared fj by dou uk dou ul. And this part, we'll have to do chain rule. We'll have two different terms. First, we'll differentiate this part. So that will be dou u by dou ui dou squared u by dou ul dou ui that is here into this term will just come in the same way and again the other term is we differentiate this part so that that will be dou squared fij by dou uk dou ul and this dou u by dou ui will come just as such 
so this is it now uh, in this we can see that uh, this uh, these things are in the derivative okay so order of differentiation is interchangeable so k and l are interchangeable so here again k and l are interchangeable since order of differentiation commutes so since in the on the left hand side k and l are interchangeable so on the right hand side also k and l must be interchangeable so this thing is actually equal to this thing also do u k do u i do f i j by do u l so on the right hand side also k and l are interchangeable now if you notice what is this so this is basically u double prime of u vector dot f j prime of u vector so this matrix is symmetric because k and l are interchangeable <coughs> so now we have proved that uh, from uh, this entropy condition u prime dot f j prime equals capital f j prime we can obtain this a symmetricity condition for u double prime dot f j f j f j prime essentially so now we'll prove the reverse like if uh, this symmetricity condition is true then this uh, condition that we started with u prime dot f j prime equals capital f j prime that holds we'll see that now so now assuming that symmetricity condition holds which means that i'm uh, this is true the symmetricity condition that we had is true so uh, earlier we told that uh, if things are symmetric we there will exist some function which satisfies some condition we made such a statement this symmetricity condition implied existence of a function gj such that this is true uh, we'll do a similar argument here essentially uh, this is the this is thing this thing is equal to this do by do ul of this thing is equal to this and this by chain rule you get this now in on the right hand side if you notice k and l are interchangeable in this term as differentiation commutes now this part is basically our uh, u double prime of u dot fj prime of u which we just derived this is symmetric we just said that here also k and l commutes so we are assuming that this is symmetric so essentially this has to be commuting because we are starting with the assumption that u double prime dot fj prime is symmetric so here k and l commutes so here also k and l are interchangeable here also k and l are interchangeable so on the right hand side k and l are interchangeable so on the left hand side as well k and l must be interchangeable so we have something like this do we have k, I, this equation I, i've just equated in, interchange k and l and i've just written over here so this is true now this is a compatibility condition that ensures the existence of some function that satisfies this thing we saw earlier right if do f i j by do u k equals do f k j by do u i then fij must be equal to do gj by do ui some function gj must exist similarly here uh, treat this as some uh, let me call this as some b okay here i is not not i is summed over so I, since summation is ca carried out i will go off you have j and k only so let me call it b k j of do by do u l equals do by do u k of b l j so this is something that we have now now this is equivalent to the same condition that we told earlier now we'll have some uh, function equivalent to this g j such uh, let me call that as capital fj such that do fj by do uk equals my bkj 
So BKJ is what? This uh, thing in the bracket. Uh, BKJ is my this function. So uh, I'm writing this BKJ as something over here. So we have obtained uh, some function capital FJ such that uh, this condition holds. Uh, you can for verification you can simply uh, differentiate this do fj by do uk with respect to l and see that th this holds order of differentiation commute so this is true the right hand side thinks they are true this is symmetricity condition essentially on the right hand side so basically this uh, symmetricity condition ensures the existence of capital fj such that this whole thing is true now uh, if you notice uh, from this we can if you notice, this is basically the condition that we started with. This is FJ, right hand side is FJ prime of U vector, and this, uh, I mean, left hand side is FJ prime of U vector, and the right hand side is U, U prime of U vector dot F cap small FJ prime of U vector. So this is the con entropy compatibility condition. So from the symmetricity condition, we are getting the compatibility condition and from the compatibility condition, we are getting the symmetricity condition. So they are both equivalent. So that is the theorem. For the general case, also we'll have some symmetricity condition. That is uh, symmetricity of this matrix U double prime dot FJ prime. So uh, if you have any strictly convex function uh, for a general system of conservation loss, then uh, for that convex function to be an entropy function, uh, this u double prime dot fj prime must be symmetric. That is that condition is equivalent to the condition that we told earlier, which is u prime dot fj prime equals capital fj prime, which is the entropy flux prime. So both are equivalent. That's what we have proved. So any doubts until here? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So we we'll proceed further. So uh, this becomes the necessary condition. The symmetricity of u double prime of u dot f j prime of u becomes the symmetricity con uh, becomes the uh, necessary condition for existence of entropy function. Now uh, let us look at another small corollary of the theorem. Um, existence of the strictly convex function u of u vector will imply that the system of conservation loss is symmetrizable. So if some function uh, u of u vector exists, then uh, this was your system, right? Dou u vector by dou t plus summation over j equals 1 to d, dou by dou xj. fj of u vector equals 0. So this this was our system of conservation loss. So to this, if we uh, dot product u double prime of u vector, so this will uh, result in this equation essentially. So this part is symmetric. We know dou uh, squared u by dou u vector square. This part is symmetric because differentiation is order of differentiation is interchangeable. So this u double prime matrix is symmetric and it is also positive definite because uh, u is conv convex and uh, we know this u double prime dot fj prime that we get. This is also symmetric. So existence of this strictly convex function will result uh, will uh, result in uh, transforming our system of conservation loss from one form to another which is a uh, we call this form as symmetric form of the system of conservation loss so the system of conservation loss essentially becomes symmetrizable if a convex entropy function exists so that is the primary takeaway and uh, let us now uh, look at an example of this, which is the usual inviscid Euler system. So uh, we know that uh, this is the thermodynamic entropy that we study. Like we must have come across this entropy, specific entropy term. And uh, tau here is the specific volume, 1 over rho. And T is a function of rho and E. Rho is density and E is internal energy. 
capital U is the strictly convex entropy function. Capital U in our context, it's the same entropy that in the additional conservation law that we have talked about. It's the same function. We are taking that function for uh, for Euler system. It becomes U can be taken as minus rho s and uh, Fj can be taken. Entropy fluxes can be taken as minus rho Uj s. So if we take this form, then uh, we'll get the additional entropy conservation law. The uh, Euler system that we told earlier. We wrote Euler system in the form of our system of conservation laws earlier. Now, uh, for the same system, if we take u to be minus rho s and fj to be minus rho uj s, then uh, the system of from for even Euler system, we have an additional conservation law which becomes the entropy conservation law itself. So uh, I, here, this is just the definition of S I've written over here. So this is just an integration of the uh, S carried out and final expression for S is given over here. So this is just to say that uh, for Euler system, uh, minus rho S becomes the entropy function in our context, in the context that we are talking and uh, minus rho ujs becomes the entropy flux function in the same context. Yeah, this is it. So today we have seen uh, the system of conservation loss and we have seen the uh, addition uh, integral form of the conservation loss. Then we saw the ad existence of additional conservation law, which is nothing but the entropy conservation law itself. And uh, this entropy conservation law will be satisfied only by the classical solution. That is this entropy function u, which is a function of small u vector. Uh, that u vector is only going to be the classical solution. It's, it cannot be the weak solution. If and only if it's the classical solution, the entropy conservation law will be satisfied. The additional conservation law will be satisfied. In the next class, we'll see uh, the weak form of this uh, system of conservation laws. And we'll see uh, the uh, occurrence of entropy inequality. The weak solutions will satisfy entropy inequality. They won't necessarily satisfy this additional conservation law. Only classical solution will satisfy the conservation law, whereas weak solutions all will satisfy the entropy inequality. We will see how that comes in the next class. Today, yeah, it's done. Like, any doubts until now? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so, so we'll stop here. Yeah. Sure, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you.